Mariam Olia works as a postdoctoral research fellow in plant science at the University of Cape Town, studying resurrection plants which can survive extreme desiccation and still recover fully upon rehydration within 24 hours. Mariam engages in science communication and public speaking to share her story of personal development whilst encouraging people to embrace science, positive psychology and spirituality. So thank you very much for having me. It is such a pleasure. Um, and I feel like Morris has actually summed up my life and what I'm currently doing quite well. Um, but this is just an example of what we do at this um, plant stress lab that is headed by Professor Jill Ferrand. Um, I also recommend um, that people go and look her up. She has a lot of great talks. She even gave a TEDx, TEDx talk and was interviewed on TV. She's amazing. And what she is aspiring to do is develop climate smart agriculture to ensure future food security. And personally, I am um, a plant ge geneticist. And what I was aiming to do during my PhD is uncover the genes responsible for salt stress. And that way we can actually work on improving salinity tolerance for crops. So let's dive in. This is just a picture of the University of Cape Town campus. I just wanted to have you see um, visually what it looks like. It's a beautiful campus right behind a table mountain uh, here in Cape Town. Highly recommend that you come and visit this incredible city, incredible country. But a short bio about me, um, and just to repeat, I grew up in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and sometimes I forget that I come from there <laughs> just because I've become such a global citizen. And yeah, the, the contrast of how I grew up and how I am now is startling. And now, of course, Saudi Arabia has changed on so many levels, and they've really been encouraging um, education on so many levels and sponsoring um, scholarships and students. And I was a recipient of one of these scholarships, uh, which is called the KAUST, well, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, KAUST, Gifted Student Program. And don't think that I'm actually quite gifted. It's just that they wanted to support, um, I suppose, bright young students. And I was among four uh, women or girls, at the time we were still girls, 17-year-olds uh, uh, among 20 boys across Saudi Arabia who were sponsored to join this program because it was very, very new and this university hadn't been built yet. Um, and with that, uh, I was taken to the UK. I did my bachelor's there um, at the University uh, College London, UCL. And at the time, it was ranked the fourth best university in the world. And they were super proud of that. They advertised it everywhere. <laughs> um, so it was, I think my life had a long series of fortunate events. Um, of course, there are sad stories in between, but again, this is life. We have to turn all these challenges into ways that we can thrive. And I'm going to keep using the word thrive because it's not about just surviving. And in this case, in, in this research, we don't want crops that only survive. We also want them to thrive under harsh conditions. Um, so anyway, these three um, highlighted um, logos include the SRSI program, which is the Saudi Research Science Institute. It's a, a franchise from the Research Institute in MI, at MIT, uh, which is focusing on research for high school students and giving them a taste of what it's like. And at the time I was a counselor for students. I, IGEM is the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition for Synthetic Biology. So I'm sure the, Austra the Australian universities that you have, have lots of these teams. So if you're interested, do look up um, their, their teams and see if you wanna join because it's an international competition. And then Sapienza is a university in Rome uh, where I stayed for a month as an intern and I did bioinformatics. Um, so this was all part of the bachelor's. Every summer I would try and do something. And I think, again, this is a main, one of the main reasons I feel like I got the scholarship in the first place because I always try to be productive and do, do useful things um, with my time. 
that would elevate me and help me grow. And then finally, I went back to Kaust and did my master's in bioscience, uh, specifically on uh, CRISPR, um, which I perhaps imagine a lot of you have heard of. It's a gene editing tool. And what happens is you are able to very accurately change a gene or edit it, um, kind of like it, it's not through crossing or breeding, but it's actually a one-time event. And then the second uh, generation, the F2 would, or F1 sometimes, would have that gene mutation that was imposed. Um, and this is something I really also love to talk about because a lot of environmentalists are like shunning gene editing and uh, genetic, genetically modified food, et cetera, and without understanding what it really is all about. Um, which is why I also want to highlight that we cannot have one single opinion be the only truth. There, ha there always has to be several sides to the same story, and especially in, in con um, conjunction with specialists. Um, because of course, we still don't understand how the genome really works, but in the, in the meantime, we can't negate the technology's potential just because some people are not using it very well, AKA a few specific companies in the US. Anyway, then I started my PhD in plant science, specifically using Arabidopsis, which is the um, model plant organism, uh, Arabidopsis thaliana. And there I focused on something called genotype, uh, well, not genotype, phenotyping and a process called forward genetics, where we know the genome, but we don't know what the genes do. Hence, we put the plants under stress and examine what they do and try and link that to the genome through association mapping, uh, which is also another story. It's a probabilistic approach in the end. It's not highly accurate. So we still need to gene, do gene editing or gene mutations to test the genes. Um, and to confirm their function. So it's a long, a long story, but we need this. And this is what I'll mention later, part of the next green evolution that we need. And so finally, I um, finished my PhD, thankfully, and moved to Cape Town. And I started my postdoctorate um, research fellowship. And here I'm focusing on um, native plants that are called resurrection plants that haven't been really examined under salt, but also their genome is not very well known. And I'll show you why they're super special. But let's move on to the next slide. Um, yes. So of course I don't need to preach um, to the choir. We know that drought is a very um, pervasive problem nowadays. Um, I actually was planning to update this map because a student uh, mentioned to me like, oh, it's from 2004. I'm like, yes, actually. Uh, when you do a lot of presentations and you like, you find a good map, you're like, this is what I wanna use. Um, but I should actually look up a, a newer updated uh, map, but it's still pretty bleak, unfortunately. And I'm only guessing it's probably looking even worse nowadays. Um, and you can tell the red, um, the red hue represents extreme drought, uh, which is reflecting a loss of perhaps like every index has its description. This is the Palmer Drought Severity uh, Index, uh, which I imagine includes um, underground water shortage, um, reduced rainfall, um, high irrigation uh, or bad irrigation practices, which um, exacerbates um, the drought problem. And just the fact that climate change has been making this even more difficult for, um, for the climate to be predicted, predictable enough and for farmers to know where they can actually do their crops or grow their crops and cultivate um, in a sustainable way. So I just wanted to highlight this, and, and for me, um, where I am in Sa where I was at Saudi, um, is quite dry, of course, um, and they are working on desert agriculture. So this is the new um, innovative way of actually wanting to innovate 
in, in this field. And of course, I also was, visited Australia. So I stayed in Canberra at the CSIRO High Resolution Plant Phenomics Center, which is opposite ANU, the Australian National University. And I stayed there for about three months, 2014, in the beginning of my PhD. Um, and it was a very soft place in my heart. It was a wonderful experience. But yeah, they're also working really hard on drought and salinity. Um, and to mirror the other extreme, let's say, um, problem under, under which a lot of agriculture is being hindered is salinity. And you see, of course, Saudi, it looks pretty salty and, and difficult to work with. Um, because it also has a sodicity problem, which relate, is related to um, the soil structure and um, the porosity and all of that. So then if you have poor soil quality and a high salinity, um, high salinity issue, it just really exacerbates the, 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 the improvement of the agriculture. And some types of, some pieces of land that were originally fertile have become salt, salty, um, either because of poor irrigation practices or change in climate, or the fact that there's still, a, there's a leakage of some sort from uh, the sea or the ocean. And that um, over time has made the soil more salty. Um, but again, uh, Australia is also uh, working on that quite a bit at uh, CSIRO and ANU. And in this case, we need we, we need another green uh, revolution um, to invigorate agriculture. Uh, apparently, based on um, estimates made by the FAO, the Food Agriculture Organization of the UN, and I found this other um, infographic by Oxfam, um, that in the year 2030, um, a lot of these major crops will suffer from uh, a decrease in growth rates. And the way that we will have to um, mitigate this risk and decrease, we'll have to work on precision agriculture, water in terms of um, highly water efficient uh, practices and just usage. And of course, we're looking at the genetics, uh, perhaps employing solar energy to reduce um, the, the reliance on uh, non-sustainable fuel sources or energy sources, and of course, biofuels. And in this talk, we're focusing on the genetics. So let me introduce to you uh, this plant or the, this type of plant, because of course, I think there are about 80 species that are within the resurrection plant uh, species or group. Um, and this one is called Rose of Jericho, or the Latin name is Sananginella. And what's interesting is under the dry state, uh, or they call it air dry state, it's five, under 5% um, hydrated, um, very little water even in the cell. And as soon as you add water to it, uh, within 24 hours, it rehydrates into that. And this you can even find on Amazon <laughs> that you can order and check it out at home. But these are pictures or time-lapse images that my uh, professor Jill Ferrand had taken, um, showing the, the change through time of these plants as they rehydrate within one day, in the case of Xerophyta humilis, and within hours, uh, in the case of Myrothamnus. Um, and Myrothamnus in particular, uh, recently um, uh, Jill has signed a deal or kind of made a research agreement, I forget, I forget the term, but to provide Giorgio Armani with samples from Myrothamnus for their facial cream anti-aging products. Can you imagine that? Um, but the, the point is we would like for these plants to be models for agriculture and for improving crop tolerance. Imagine all these crops that will have um, predicted growth rate decreases. Imagine when there's a drought, they just go into dormancy. And whenever there's rain, it comes back to life and then people have their harvest. I think that's like an amazing prospect one day. And let me 
like highlight to you the plant that I'm working on. So it's called Eragrostis mendensis, and this is what it looks like in the wild. And it has a relative um, called Eragrostis teff, and which is an orphan crop. And what's interesting is teff is um, used as a superfood, and apparently it has high levels of calcium, magnesium, protein, iron, uh, fiber. So it's been marketed as a uh, superfood, but it's already a staple uh, crop uh, in Ethiopia and Eritrea. I don't know if anybody has tried injera, which is this big pancake thing that you see here in the image, and they would add different um, different dishes you say it could say like meat or vegetarian and you just break away part of this injera and you eat it with the hands kind of like naan bread basically um and there are lots of restaurants here in cape town so it was really cool to actually eat it by and made by the locals and then think about wow i'm actually researching how to improve this crop because at the moment um it's quite cheap for them in eritrea but it hasn't become really um, mainstream um, but also it's highly like unfortunate for, for this crop to also turn into the second the next quinoa um, because quinoa became so expensive for the Bolivians and the Peruvians the people who actually grow it for them to buy it because it just got marketed as the next superfood and um, the production scaled without actually improving the harvesting because it's actually quite difficult to harvest um, it's not mechanized yet, basically. So that's the trick. Um, so I really recommend uh, if you have an Ethiopian restaurant nearby, please do try this dish. And I wanted to also highlight a different uh, plant that I looked into. Uh, it's called Zerophyta schlechtrai. Um, took me ages to pronounce this name. <laughs> um, and in Jill's lab, she had students who also examined this plant in relation to maize and rice in particular. And there's an actual um, publication that describes how Xerophyta schlechtrai could be used as a model species for, um, for maize. Mm. But in, in the genetic form, meaning some of the genes that are in Xerophyta schlechtrai could be um, used and or the homologous genes. Homolog homologous genes means the gene that looks very similar to it but is innate in that other crop. So there's there's no need to move genes, there's no need to cross. It's just a matter of actually enhancing that gene or, or silencing it, etc. So let me show you um, some data or research that's been done by Dr. Dr. Christine Madden. Uh, when I joined um, as a postdoc three years ago now, uh, she was still finishing her PhD and she shared um, her research with uh, Lindensis. Um, so these are her pictures. She took um, the same plants and grouped them or looked at the leaves from the perspective of these non-senescent leaves, which are the young ones in the middle versus the senescent leaves, are the, old, the older ones are on the outside. Um, so the plant actually doesn't rehydrate entirely. It kind of uh, forgoes the old leaves. They kind of sacrifice themselves for the younger leaves, the younger shoots to come out. Uh, so as you can see on the first column, there's 100% hydration. And then you start going down the, the list. And RWC refers to relative water content. Um, so you can see the coloring of the leaves and how the, the, the porosity or even curling of the leaf changes depending on uh, its hydrate, hydrated state. And within 72 hours, you see here, the plant is actually back to being green, uh, whereas uh, the senescent leaves um, just died. And here's another um, image of the entire plant, as you can see how um, beautiful it is that it actually rehydrates on its own. Um, and so these plants naturally adapted to the environment here in South Africa. And I think there are lots around the world. Uh, we had a, 
um, an exchange student, a PhD student from Spain, and she's looking, she was looking at resurrection ponds in the Mediterranean. I had no idea they also grew there. So that's why I'm quite optimistic about finding plants that will adapt for um, future climate change uh, scenarios. Um, it's not that bleak, but we need to hurry <laughs> a little bit and not make it worse. Um, so let me just show you um, a few pilot studies or pilot um, experiments that I did with um, the PhD student that I was working with. Unfortunately, she had to resign after lockdown and it just wasn't clear. And she's like, well, I can always go back and finish the PhD, but I wanted to still show her results. Um, so we had these, um, these plants that we inherited from Chrissy and we wanted to examine how do they react under salt stress. So on the left, you see um, the labeling of all the plants and what salt stress I, uh, we imposed, um, sodium chloride. And I wanted to push the plants to 600 millimolar sodium chloride, which is super high. My um, Arabidopsis plants uh, were treated with 250 uh, millimolar sodium chloride, but I already um, factored in the water content that was in the soil, uh, which was about which 60, which, yeah, which was 60 percent, which gave a net value of 100 millimolar sodium chloride, and that was not too hot and not too cold, just Goldilocks middle. Um, so that's 100 for the small plants that are talking about Arabidopsis. Um, so for an a, a proper plant to maintain itself at 600, which is a so, yeah, higher salt salinity than seawater. I think a typical, a typical ocean um, salinity level will be around 500 or 400. And it was really cool because we got to see um, a rapid uh, change. So we saw this leaf curling phenomena. We saw crystals of um, salt being excreted on the leaf blade. It was awesome. And, and the fact that the plant was still surviving and it didn't die, uh, I think for another two weeks. And after four weeks, we decided we left the plants um, just to dry. Uh, it wasn't really intended. Um, and my Jill, the professor, even said, like, why don't you rehydrate the plants and see what happens? Uh, so we watered them again, and then you see there's a new shoot coming out. How incredible is that? And that's the 200 millimolar sodium chloride uh, treated plant. And, and now I'm actually preparing a new experiment where I will, again, treat the plants with salinity, uh, drought, and then the combined um, stress of both uh, under a phenotyping uh, machinery so that I have different stations. They take pictures of the plants um, in the RGB form, so red, green, blue, just normal pixels. And these would be analyzed to, say, to measure size, area, um, different mathematical models that can, um, let's say, estimate the change through time that I can compare with uh, the control and we'll do chlorophyll fluorescence imaging and maybe thermal, I'm not sure, but imagine that type of data. And that's really basically what I did with my PhD. Um, uh, and I forgot to mention uh, my ex-student's name, Putimelo Marope. So in, in summary, like what we would like to establish is this and understand what are the co-expression networks? What are the genes doing? What are they? influencing and which ones are relevant to drought, which ones are relevant to salt, is there crosstalk, are the same genes doing the same stuff or is it different? Um, and of course, look at physiological assessments and which I will do now with my um, phenotyping and it's high throughput phenotyping. So it's robotics assisted. Um, it's very difficult to do manual phenotyping, um, which is what we did with this small study. And hopefully by then we would uh, identify appropriate genes in these resurrection plants and in, and in that um, provide more value in, let's say, genomics assisted breeding, which is understanding what the genome does, which genes are most important, and then 
the plants are crossed uh, through a normal breeding program, which takes a long time though, but at least if there's some uh, hint that these plants have this gene, hence they're more likely to be tolerant, they're more likely to be uh, superior. Um, and finally, if it's possible to in introgress the, the genes that are superior or useful from these resurrection plants and put them in their relatives or models, just like Aircrossus mendensis to TEF, their sister species. Uh, so that transition could be very easily done relatively. Um, and finally, improve drought and salt stress with that. Um, and to summarize, why are we doing this? We would like to address um, the sustainability development goal two. Um, and in our case, we do it with plant stress tolerance research, hopefully achieve food security, um, perhaps even improve nutrition. There are many um, researchers out there that have been trying to genetically engineer crops to have, uh, to be fortified. But a lot of um, people are just afraid of the technology and, you know, shut it down. They don't want to even engage in the prospect of having that, but it would really make a huge difference. Uh, and finally promote sustainable agriculture. And I just want to acknowledge uh, the Plant Stress Lab team. Uh, so this is Professor Jill Ferent, super cool human. Um, and there's her collaborator, Professor Heng Hillhorst, who um, works in Wageningen, which is an amazing university in the Netherlands. Um, a lot of uh, their research has an intersection of industry, academia, and uh, humanitarian efforts. Uh, which is why I was keen to also visit Bachnigan, but with lockdown, it didn't work out, but it's okay. Um, and then Christine uh, is the one that provided um, the data on Indensis, and then Astrid um, gave me or shared insights about Zero Fight Schlecht Try. And then there's uh, Tumi, uh, the PhD student I was working with, and then of course me. And I thank you for listening. Bye.